<laughs> you don't want to leave me up there alone, huh? <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee again that Thy Spirit will be among us to guide our minds to a deeper understanding of thy word. We pray that we will use this blessing wisely and be responsive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Okay, what do we know for sure? What do we know? What's the first question? What's the first question? Authorship. Okay. What do we know about authorship? Peter didn't write it. <laughs> that's a discouraging way to begin, first Peter, but that's the facts. Peter didn't write it. Peter was behind it, right? Okay. What? I think he wrote second Peter with his own hand. The first Peter, well, authorship then? Authorship, first Peter? Silas, Silvanus, the gymnasium, the prophets. Yes, Silas the prophet. Good. <laughs> the prophet Silas, the gymnasium educated Greek Jew. From what area? What's the center of Greek Judaism? We look around the Mediterranean. Where's the center of Greek Judaism? I don't want to say Italy. No, I Greek. Greece. No. Uh, say anything, you're doing strong. <laughs> Greece wasn't the only place where there were Greeks. Alexander conquered a great empire and left his four generals in charge of the world when he died. And one of those generals founded a city in Egypt because his share of the Alexandrian Empire was Egypt, right? And these were the Ptolemies, right? General Ptolemy became the founder of this Greek dynasty in Egypt. Cleopatra, our Cleopatra, was a somewhat um, long-necked, long-featured, bulbous, blonde Greek woman. <laughs> I'm sorry to... <laughs> well, we have pictures of her. She wasn't the movie star of late fame. <laughs> she was who she was, and her pictures won't go away. In it, it, she was a Greek. And what was the great Greek city in Egypt? Alexandria with the Alexandrian Museum and the Alexandrian Library, the largest library in the world. We said the Septuagint was translated as the first great translation of a foreign work in history, translated into Greek at the request of Ptolemy III to join his library. Why did Ptolemy III want a copy of the Jewish scriptures? Because Alexandria had a million Jews in it a million Jews in Alexandria. And the great gymnasium at Alexandria, connected to the museum, was the source of uh, the learning of Jewry, Apollos and Silas and so forth that we're talking about here. All right, so Alexandrian Greek Judaism, non-Palestinian form. Uh, all right, so, Paul, Peter rather, and Silvanus or Silas, the authors. 
What comes after authorship? All right. Who was the writer? To whom was he speaking? Second critical question. Uh, all right. To whom were Peter, the apostle, and Silas, the prophet, speaking in this work? I didn't say this book because, of course, it wasn't a book. There were books in, uh, in the first century world, the Roman world. There were books, books in our sense, books bound on one side and with pages. We call them codexes or codices, depending on how you want to deal with a Latin word. There were books. This was in no sense a book. What was it? A letter. Yes. Well, how do we know that? Well, it has the, the senders and the recipients and uh, the standard uh, Roman letter form. To, from, greeting. Okay. Uh, it's a letter. As such, it would have been written on papyrus and rolled up and carried by hand. Uh, to whom? Now, to whom? Well, exiles is a better word. You said exiles. The exiles of the dispersion. This is a technical term. What is implied by this exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia? Where are these places? They're still there. Uh, meaning, what country? Turkey. This is most of modern Turkey covered here. What is the implication of the phrase, the exiles of the dispersion? For what was the word diaspora a technical term? The diaspora. What was the dispersion? If you were talking in Jerusalem and you were talking in common uh, language and you in the course of conversation you said well what do the people of the dispersion think of what would you be speaking dispersed Jews for instance there were more Jews in Alexandria than in Judea again let's review what W.D. Davies and Hoki Miramias and other New Testament scholars tell us we can think or guess about the Roman world from what statistics we do have. And we have a lot of statistics about the Roman world. The Roman world was the, the ring of the Mediterranean Sea and its outlying parts, held together by the Pax Romana and its legal system and its roads and its trade system. How many people approximately in the Roman world? Between 500 and 550 million. Divided into thousands of pagan sects, each worshiping the nature gods in temples that were localized and exhibiting a remarkable freedom of religion. From what did this freedom of religion flow? It flowed from the worship of the various forces of nature. So that if one person worshiped the local river and another the local trees and another the local mountain and another the local winds, they were all the forces of nature based on the same principle and there was therefore no exclusion. In addition, there was identification or syncretism, right? Baal in the east is simply Zeus in the west. Same stories, same, only it's not Mount Hermon anymore where Baal sits. Where is it now? It's Mount Olympus, okay? It's the same set of stories. Uh, we in the Western world, when we tell stories, we go back to Greece. Most people think that these stories originated in Greece and think that the locale was 
Olympus. Those stories were bought by the Greeks between the 9th and 6th century BC, were bought at the price of trade from the East. Okay? Uh, yeah. So, this identification meant that if you worshipped Artemis or Diana, those were two different go goddesses, that's okay. They're the same thing. No problem. If you worship Artemis in the East, you could worship Diana in the West. No problem. So there was a great freedom of religion. Everybody was tolerant of everybody else's religion except for one group. Who were the intolerant ones? What? The Jews. The Jews. Why were the Jews intolerant? Only one God. Yes. And they had, there was a corollary to that. There's only one God and the God isn't what? The God isn't any of these. It's because he's not a God in nature. Because he's the God who stands outside of nature and created all things, he's not any of those. And then there was a worse corollary. The worship of those things is blasphemy, is evil, is reprehensible and abomination. And people who do those things, what? God will... Yeah. Now, this was very different from every other religion. The priests of Artemis didn't care if you also worshipped Apollo. But the priests of Judaism cared a lot if you worshipped anything other than Jehovah. And they probably didn't mind telling everybody that. That was what they wanted to tell people. Now, could the Roman world escape Judaism? Well, Judaism was over there in Judea, right? No. Where was Judaism? Everywhere. How did it get everywhere? Well, initially it had gone east because of the exile, the Assyrian and Babylonian exile. How had it gone west? Following trade. The Jews in the exile in the east became business people. And their trade in the east in Persia, in what had been Babylonia and Assyria, led them west, straight across through the entire Roman Empire. Now again, what did it matter what the tiny Jewish religion said about anything? There were thousands of sects. What did it matter what the tiny Jewish sect said about anything? Well, they were wealthy, yes. They could control a tremendous amount of the wealth of the empire. What else? Wherever there's wealth, there's political influence. What else? As, yeah. There wasn't... While Diana might have had many temples in many places, unrelated to each other, in Judaism, not only was there one God, what else was there? One temple... One ritual, right? And more than this, as to numbers, the million Jews in Alexandria meant what? While it may have been a minority, it was 40% of the population. What does that mean? If you have 40% of the population in a cohesive religion, and you have 60% of the population in divided religions, then what do you have? You have the majority religion. The Roman Empire early made Judaism a, an approved religion, a legal religion. Religio litica, legal religion, why? Well, there, could, there wouldn't be any, any hope of doing otherwise. The point being that Judaism's cohesiveness made it the largest religion in the Roman Empire. The largest and the wealthiest religion in the Roman Empire. With size and money comes power, of course. Now, 
the Jews created the ghetto, right? The Jews created the ghetto. What was the ghetto? Oh, but the Jews created it. It's much more specific than that. What was the ghetto? Not a ghetto, but the ghetto. What was the ghetto? It was the place in the Roman cities where what? Why did they live in a quarter or a section of the city? To keep from being made unclean? Yes, because of their constant concern over purity. <laughs> the need for purity meant that you couldn't live with the Gentiles. And a Jewish businessman had constantly to deal with the problem of being physically in contact with the Gentiles. He had to talk to the shipmaster. He had to have his wares laden. He had to receive the incoming goods. He had to go to the bazaar and sell them. Okay? And, uh, of course, that meant that he had to go through ritual purification by the time we come to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And that's why these synagogues had the ritual baths around them. Ritual baths where the Jews could immerse themselves and purify themselves for the service. Yeah. The con of course, it says something about you and me if somebody, after having talked to us, has to do what? Take a bath. Yes. If being around us means that they have to go wash, what does it say? <laughs> you, by definition, are an unclean, inferior person. Yeah. Uh, now, the Jews' cohesiveness in this great ghetto in every city meant that they were very visible and easy targets. Somebody who's different, between sameness and difference, the human mind goes towards sameness, Yes, there they were. They were different. They were very different. Were the Jews different? Yeah, they were very different. Um, then we have to say something about the Jewish religion in its defense and all this. The Jews, by their actions, implied that they were better than the rest of the world. That they were morally better. When we look at it, what do we have to say? The Roman world was a mess, morally. It was wonderful uh, as far as trade or politics. They imposed a great peace that lasted for two centuries on a wild world. Uh, there were many things wonderful about the Roman world, but morally it was a mess. And what could you say about the Jews as a people by comparison? As a people, as a whole, although they had great hatreds internally, as a whole, they were far and away, far beyond anything else in the Roman world. Their, their uh, social structure, their family structure, their internal organization, their constant goal of upholding the law, and their constant exposure to scriptures made them by far the people that you would want to associate with. Did this influence the Roman world? Yes, it did. In two ways. A great many converts to Judaism. Now, a Gentile being converted to Judaism went through a total change. A change in religious beliefs from many gods of nature to the one God who stands outside of nature and a change in culture. What sort of things changed? Diet. Diet. Yes, absolutely. Uh, becoming a Jew meant you became a vegetarian. Why? First of all, the, lo the law so proscribed the use of meat that you, you virtually could never use it under most conditions. But what more than that? In the Roman world, in the Roman world, yes, in the Roman world, what happened with every piece of meat? It was offered to the gods. And in Jewish law, what? 
could never touch anything that had been dedicated to the pagan gods. There were Jewish farms outside nearly every city. There were great Jewish agricultural estates outside of nearly every Roman city. For what purpose? Just to feed the Jews? Yes. <laughs> to get some righteous food. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, the convert to Judaism would physically move. Why would he move? The whole family would move. Why? Yes, so they could be in the ghetto and be clean. See, the irony of the word ghetto was what? The ghetto was originally what? The clean, wealthy, <laughs> Jewish part of the city as opposed to what? The dirty, squalid slum parts, yeah. Now there's an irony. And the ghetto was not created by the pagan world as uh, disliking the Jews. It was created by the Jews desire to stay away from the pagan world. In areas where there were very few Jews, we see them in Acts worshiping outside the city. Okay. Yeah. Converts, yes. Many converts, well, the spread of Christianity would suggest that there were many converts. And then there were those who believed in Judaism but didn't want to take the final step men who didn't want to be circumcised, families who couldn't move to the ghetto, people who worshipped with the Jews but had not become members. They were the God-fearers. The so-called God-fearers. Jewish converts who hadn't taken the step of joining the religion. All right. Now the interplay between the the Jewish religion in the Roman world is complex. Of course, when you get religion and politics and money all interwoven, you can imagine the complexity of the relationship. There's a story in Acts that after, after Peter and Paul worked together at Antioch for some time, possibly three years total, that there was an agreement that Paul would do one thing and Peter would do another. What did they agree to do? What? Paul would go to the Gentiles and Peter would go to the circumcision. Did that mean that Peter would go back to Palestine and Paul would sail off to Rome? No, 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 no. Why? Yes, because there were Jews everywhere there were Gentiles. That didn't mean that Peter and Paul wouldn't be in the same places, but what? Using somewhat different methods, they would be appealing to Paul primarily to Gentiles and Peter primarily to Jews because they felt after. You remember in the Old Testament prophets, particularly the latter part of Isaiah, that there's this picture of the great ingathering of the world, and the word ingathering is used by the prophet from the old uh, agricultural festival of the ingathering of the grain, that there'd be this great ingathering of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles come from the east and west to worship the Lord, and they have one name from Assyria to the west, it says. Okay, Now, the Christian believers saw in Christ and his coming and in Gentile conversions the fulfillment of this old prophecy of the ingathering. So naturally they saw the Jews and Gentiles coming into the Christian church as one unit. Peter and Paul were in the same places. Now where did Peter end up by this time when he's speaking of the fiery trial that's about to come upon you, using his words. Where was he? He was, well, he was, he was in Rome, but he doesn't say Rome. In Babylon. As you read through First Peter, 
it's very clear that Peter is telling his hearers that a, a great tribulation is about to come upon them. And he's addressing the exiles of the dispersion. Now we said that the dispersion originally was the diaspora was the word for the Jews scattered throughout the world outside of the promised land, outside of the old Canaan, outside of... See, Galilee would not be the diaspora, even though the Galileans were looked down upon by the Judeans. It was inside the old covenant land. Anything outside the old covenant land from Persia to Spain was the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews throughout the world. Okay? Now then, the apostles write as if the Christian church is the new Israel. This happens frequently. It's implicit and explicit in the New Testament. The church is the new Israel. And so Peter, with great ease, adopts the Jewish term for the scattered exiles. Well, why were they exiles? Well, they were outside the covenant land. These Jews living in Rome considered themselves exiles. They may be going to be living there all their lives, but what? They're the exiles. That's the homeland back there. The diaspora is the scattered Jews. But here, who is it? It's the scattered Christians. He adopts the phrase for Judaism throughout the world and applies it to the Christians. To the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All right. Where is Pontus? It's still there. The point is still there. The point juts out into what body of water? No. <laughs> Where is Pontus? The point. The capital of the, uh, of the place is located on the point. The point juts out into what body of water? I said. No, not the Aegean, not the Mediterranean, so there's only one option left, the Black Sea, yes. You'll remember that Turkey is bordered on the north by the Black Sea. On the west, it connects to Asia, on the east, the Aegean, and on the south, the Mediterranean. So having eliminated the Mediterranean and the Aegean, we go to the Black Sea. This is northern Turkey, along the coast of the Black Sea. Uh, these are names for areas or districts that covered most of modern Turkey. They're not exactly the political divisions that the Roman Empire had made up of the same name. You see, there was a Roman province entitled Bithynia-Pontus. And that's how it's always referred to, Bithynia Pontus. But this starts at the top and works around in a giant circle. If you included everything that was in these areas, you'd have all of Turkey. From Pontus down the mountains to the south and east of Pontus through Galatia, and basically eastern Turkey, down to Cappadocia on the southern coast, along the south of Turkey, Asia Minor on the west coast, and finally back up to the northwest side of Turkey where you would be at Bithynia, which had been joined in 116 BC to Pontus as one Roman province. Yes? Now, after he finished writing this, he gave it to somebody. That somebody then made a circuit of all of this territory. Yes. Went, yes. Or, or did they just make a bunch of copies in heaven? No, no. This was an encyclical. An encyclical was not an unusual thing. If the Roman emperor wanted to tell all the governors in the east a certain thing, what would he do? He wrote it, he wrote it to all of these people, and it was an encyclical that what? Was taken by the apostle to all of these areas. areas. 
who might have been, can't prove this, who might have been Peter's apostle. Mark is a good option. Mark might have been Peter's apostle with this encyclical. Could this, have been it could have been Silas. He wasn't around for the second yes. Epistle. Who wasn't there when Peter wrote a second follow-up letter. It could have been Silas. I lean towards Silas. <laughs> now, this leads to an interesting question. It's conjecture, but I don't think it's very conjectural. Why didn't Peter go? He, was in jail. <laughs> he couldn't. Peter had to stay at Rome for two reasons. His work was in Rome, and the emperor invited him to stay in Rome. <laughs> Did the emperor of the time know who he had? Did he know that he had... I hesitate in behalf of your Protestant minds. Did he know that he had the head of the Christian church? Oh, sure he did. Now, another question. Why these Christians? Why Asia Minor? Why Turkey? Why all of Turkey? Why not the Christians in Judea? Why not the Christians in Italy? Why not the Christians in Africa? Why here? Well, that's a possibility. Maybe he just had friends there. Maybe they were near and dear to him because he had worked there. What's interesting is Paul had worked in Galatia, had intended to go to Cappadocia, had worked in Asia. These were Paul's territories. Many of these churches were churches that Paul had founded. What was Peter doing writing to them? Why them? Now these churches were made up of a Jewish nucleus, by which I mean people who had been born Jews, who were Semites. And what else did they have? They had Gentiles who had what? First been Jews. Okay. One class was Jews by birth. A second and larger class was Jews by conversion, who then went on to become Christians. And a third class was? New converts. No? We're putting them in the second class. Those who became Christians straight, cold. Those are Paul's converts. Straight from paganism to Christianity, cold, without a Jewish background. This middle group the first group, Jews by birth, and the second group, Gentiles who had become Jews, were Peter's responsibility. Paul's was the direct converse. Why here? Because a great tribulation was about to come on the world, according to Peter. And because most Christians in the Roman Empire were where? They weren't anymore in Palestine. Oh yes, there was still a Jewish Christian church numbering several thousand that continued to center right in Jerusalem till just before its destruction. But they weren't most Christians. Most Christians weren't in Samaria. They weren't in Antioch. They weren't in Rome. Another question. You just said that Peter was warning these people of a great tribulation. Could this have been a revelation from Silas because of him being a prophet? Oh, yes, the gift of prophecy. One of the questions that you have is, 
did Peter know that the Neronian persecution was about to break out because he knew Nero and knew what to expect of Nero? Or did he know by revelation that the persecution was coming? Well, Jesus had said that the destruction of Jerusalem, which they interpreted to be the end of the world, would be in this generation. In 62 AD, when Paul was killed, Peter was living in Rome. That was 30 years after the death of Christ. And Peter makes it clear, as you read here, he expects what? He expects the end to come soon. And it was part and parcel of Christian eschatology that what would come before the end? Before the end, what would come? Jesus had said, the, then will dawn the great tribulation and they will deliver you up before kings and prefects and so forth. Jesus had predicted a great tribulation before the destruction of Jerusalem in that generation. So Peter, quite apart from specific revelation, what? Would have known that the, shortly will come a great tribulation. Now two events sparked this understanding, okay? Two events. Aha. We interrupt to note the importance of the offering plate. What might the two events have been? Oh, did I make it clear? I was leading in a certain direction. I'm not sure I made it clear. Why did Peter and Silas write to the Christians in this place and not some other? Yes, that's where the Christian church was centered. The book of Revelation, after all, takes place where? Where's the book of Revelation take place? What is its setting? The Roman province of Asia. Yeah, the seven churches that are in Asia which were the largest churches in the Roman world. It's no surprise that the Apostle John ended up there. Why? That's where most Christians were. You follow? There were some Christians at Rome. Peter was at Rome, ultimately because he was a prisoner, but even before that, because he had to be there. Why? But why was, he, why was it necessary to be there? Huh? Yes, because of the very importance of the capital of the Roman world to the Christian church. And I've said often enough now to underscore it that Peter was the boss and had to be where? Where these important things were happening. Now, what happened just prior to this that would have indicated to Peter that the time of the tribulation had come. What caused him to write this encyclical? Oh, by the way, when he read it, wrote it and sent it to Asia, I'm sure they kept a copy and they knew what Peter was thinking right there in Rome. It's in the Western canon right from the beginning. Uh, No, the Roman world was very secure at this time. Its only danger was internal. Let's see, there was Caesar Augustus and when he died, his son Tiberius took over and reigned well for many years, right? And then, and then there was a series of misfortunes for the for the Roman world. Uh, there was some disruption, you remember. They had a series of unfortunate people. There was the insane Caligula. Uh, but fortunately, after the insane Caligula, we had the stable. Well, actually, the only member of the family left 
the the Romans the Roman leadership killing each other on such a regular basis they turned to the paralytic Claudius who turned out to be a very able and stable emperor and things went quite well under Claudius remember the famine that Agabus predicted during the reign of Claudius then you remember Claudius was murdered by his second wife remember her who was that famous lady infamous in Christian history hmm. even Mrs. White the last chapter of Great Controversy mentions her by name Agrippina who had murdered her husband with the mushrooms so that she could get her son Claudius's stepson onto the throne hoping thereby to become exceedingly influential more influential with her son than her husband how did that turn out he murdered her, he murdered her. yes Nero murdered his mother uh, it's one of his first official acts was he murdered his mother it's very popular with the people because he emptied the Roman treasury there were good times for a while <laughs> unfortunately we know <laughs> that if you empty your treasury for six or eight years what's going to happen <laughs> then there's bound to be some bad times thereafter we know this story <laughs> well the bad times caught up with Nero uh, he, he followed a ploy which was to blame the Senate <laughs> for all his troubles. When the treasury ran dry, he said, well, the Senate spent all the money. Uh, if, yeah, I, I, this is really true. I'm not making it up. <laughs> yes. Um, eventually, that didn't work either. He fled to Greece. The Senate sent an army to get him. He killed himself or asked himself to be killed, saying, what a, what a great poet and musician dies in me. But in 62 AD, a far more serious event, Paul was tried before the emperor the second time. And what emperor was it? Nero. Nero. If it had been Claudius, everything would have been OK. But the half-crazy young Nero, I mean, this is absurd to think of Paul being tried by Nero. Nero was one of the worst people in history, and Paul was one of the greatest in history. The Jewish Sanhedrin was to be blamed for it. Well, that's true. That's correct. That's right. It was the Jews who had done this to Paul. Why? They wanted him out of the way. But why? Because he made converts to Christianity that didn't have to follow the Jewish law. Peter was there. Paul was mur murdered by Nero. It's hard at this distance to know the truth of it. Rome burned in the s summer of 64. Nero had been talking about rebuilding the city on a massive scale to get the economy moving again. He'd been talking about it for a couple of years. When fires broke out all over the city, Nero was away. But people suspected, what? We, we don't know whether the suspicion is true or not. We just don't know. But they suspected, given his prior performance, that he had set fire to the city to force its rebuilding and get the economy moving again with great public works okay well if it was Nero's plan if that if he in fact was behind it it backfired why as soon as people said the Emperor did it there was a great outcry so what did he say no no he said the Jews did it following a not 
Well, the people hated the Jews. The, but the Jews were too influential. When he said the Jews did it, what happened? The Jews waited on him with some implications of what would happen if he tried to hang this on them. And, and here we do know he changed his story. What did he say next? The Christians did it. They found a scapegoat, as it were. And so began the great Neronian persecution. When Nero died two, later, two years later in 66 AD, the Roman-Jewish war had already begun. Yeah. When he died, the great Roman-Jewish war that was to end in the destruction of Jerusalem was already underway. In this setting, Peter writes to the great body of Christians, warning them to be faithful despite the trials they are already experiencing and soon to experience. Why is Paul not writing to them? Why is Paul not there in Galatia or Asia Minor? Why is Peter writing to the churches where Paul worked? Well, Paul was dead. And Peter very naturally is concerned as he sees the moment approaching. And it's this concern that sparks the great encyclical that is First Peter. Yes? No, the Roman Jewish war was sparked by messianic movements. The Roman Jewish war was sparked by the murder of James, by Albinus, a related event of persecution. But the Roman Jewish war was not caused by Nero saying anything about the Christians. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the exiles of the dispersion, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The whole of Turkey. Whoever took this letter <laughs> had a long, long trip to make. How did they go in those days? By foot. By foot. Yeah. They hated horses. <laughs> Saddles hadn't been invented yet, and therefore horses were very difficult to ride and only the Roman army trained only the equestrian part of the Roman army trained in riding horses would think of riding a horse they used horses all the time for what to pull carts the rich went in carts but most people didn't like going in carts why they hadn't invented one little thing that made a cart really useful what was that springs they didn't have springs yet. They had these wonderful Roman roads which were, were, which were paved with, with stone, generally 18 inches thick. But what's the, what does that mean? Every, every two feet, there's a bump. If you're gonna go a thousand miles and you don't have springs, you would rather walk than go in a cart or on a horse. Some of the wealthy carry, were carried in litters and some went on mules. How did, oh yes, I said how did they go, yes. Yes, going east was much easier than going west because of the winds. And the Roman uh, a ship had but one square rigged sail, so it was slow at best. A tailwind was great. You could get from Rome to Turkey, you could get up to Pontus all right. And it wasn't impassable, there were good Roman roads. It was just a long, long walk. All right. To the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, leaving off at Bithynia because that's where you would take ship to go back to Rome, which clearly the person taking this letter was intending to do, chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling 
with his blood. Uh, you notice the Trinity in the greeting? Chosen and destined by God the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Where was the blood sprinkled? Where was the blood sprinkled? If you ask me that personally, I will answer you. Sprinkled on my heart. Okay. Where does it come from? It comes from the heart of God. No, I'm, I'm looking for background now. Where does it come from, huh? Before the mercy seat. And also at the base of the altar. Originally, this word for sprinkling is the Septuagint word for putting it on the lintels of the Passover. But by the first century, Jews did not put the Passover blood on their lintels anymore. Hadn't been done for centuries. The Passover blood was sprinkled only where? In the temple. This is part and parcel of that theology of the New Testament that the church is what? That the church is the blood was sprinkled in the temple only in the first century that the church is the temple the temple it's one of the major themes in the New Testament the church is the temple when you're measuring the courts in Revelation what measure the outer court what are you measuring you're measuring, you're judging Gentile Christians. The church is the temple. And you are the temple. Yes. Uh, back, to, back to how I answered your question a moment ago, that the sprinkling of the blood is my acceptance of the blood of Jesus Christ to me. Uh, yes. So the, the sprinkling of the blood at that time in the temple is only a figure, a figure of what Jesus Christ would have done and did for you and me. That's right. Now, the... The sprinkling here indicates that most of the readers have what kind of a background? This is the opening sentence. This will tell us something about the people to whom the letter is addressed. Using the technical term for the sprinkling of the Passover blood on the altar indicates what? Or people of Jewish conversion. Yes, that's right. Who have a background in the Septuagint for whom the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the Old Testament in Greek is the Bible. All right. So he's telling these people that they were predestined to be obedient to Christ. All right. Now, what does he say about the coming tribulation? And what does he tell them to do about it? Well, that's further down the road. <laughs> Thank you. We want to welcome you here this morning to another blessed Sabbath day. I trust that you enjoyed your Sabbath school lesson. We welcome our visitors our friends and our family and our regular members. I invite you to join with me in praising the Lord in songs. Our first song for today will be 382. O day of rest and gladness, O day of joy and light, O balm of care and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, on thee, the high and lowly, who bend before the throne singing holy, holy, holy to the eternal one. Number 382 in your hymn notes. All together. O oh, day of rest and gladness, O oh, day of joy and light, O oh, balm of care and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, on thee the high and lowly, though bend 
stand before thy throne Sing holy, holy, holy To the eternal one Bear with me Thou art a port protected From storms around us rise a garden intersected with streams of paradise. Thou art a cooling fountain in life's dry, dreary land. From thee, like Pisgah's mountain, we view the promised land of play of sweet reflection thou art a day of love a day to raise affection from earth to things above new grace is ever gaining from this our day of rest we see the rest remaining in mansions of the blessed thank you very much uh, for supporting me on that song uh, number 369, bringing in the sheaves. 369, bringing in the sheaves. All together. So when in the morning, so when ease of kindness, so when in the new tide and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest and the time of weeping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, so in the sunshine. Sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, going forth with weeping, going forth with weeping, sowing for the Master. Though the loss sustained, our spirits often grieve. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And after we have brought in the sheaves, we shall be marching to Zion. Marching to Zion, number 422. Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in the song of sweet accord, join in the song of sweet accord, and thus around the throne. We're all marching to Zion, and I'd like to be there, and I know you would too. Number 422. All together. 
Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those refuse, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly key, but children of the heavenly key, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Last stanza. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, that beautiful city of God. Number 223, crown him with many crowns. 223, crown him with many crowns, a lamb on his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless love, king of all eternity. Crown him with many crowns, 223. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side. Those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight. And downward bends his wandering eyes, but mystery so great. Fourth stanza. Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time. Creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. Oh, hail, Redeemer, hail, though thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This will be our last song. We shall stand on this one.
Number 337, redeem how I love to proclaim it. We shall sing the first and last. Shall we stand on this song here? All together. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of a lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercies. His child and forever I am. Redeem, redeem, redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Last stanza. I know there's a crown that is waiting in yonder bright mansion for me. And soon with the saints made perfect, at home with the Lord I shall be. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Let us remain standing as we invite the presence of the Lord in this place. As a matter of fact, why don't we just kneel reverently before the Lord? Eternal Father in heaven, we thank you that you have spared our lives yet again to give us the time to repent of all our sins. We are grateful that you are our Father and that you have brought us all together to praise your name. We ask, Heavenly Father, that as our leaders lead us in your service, that you will help them, Heavenly Father, help us to hold up their hand and they to hold up ours. We thank you for your blessings. Be with us, our visitors, and our friends. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, and welcome to Sabbath School. I realize I'm sitting in different places this morning, so you might want to look over here. This morning's topic is on family worship. As our relationship with Christ becomes stronger, we realize that it is important that we make him the center of our lives. It is also important to share his story with others. It is necessary not only to keep our relationship strong, but to teach our families about his love. The instruction of our children and youth in developing a personal relationship with God is very necessary. Bible stories, nature stories, good books, and worship styles are all important to family life. And one of the ways that the children of Israel learned scripture was to sing scripture. I'd like to introduce you this morning to a few songs that you can find in your Bibles that you might be able to use in your own personal and family worship. Um, the first one is in Micah 6.8 and if you know these songs you can sing it along with me at, begin, at the beginning. Micah 6.8 asks us to tell us he has shown the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. I'll be singing the song through once, and then I'll ask that you join me. And we'll be going through about four songs this morning that emphasize scripture. The neat thing about this is when you're singing these songs, you memorize them. So in those times when you're alone or depressed, you can bring up these songs and sing them and praise God for your blessings and not all your aches and pains. So he has shown thee at first. He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord be part of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Can you join me, please? He has shown thee, O man, what is good, 
And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Let's sing that one more time. I didn't hear everybody. Let's wake up this morning. He has shown thee. Ready? He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God? Another one is based on Isaiah 35.10. So if you'll turn to Isaiah 35.10, you'll see very similar to Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. Psalm 35.10 said, And the ransom of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. This promise is good to remember when we're down, that there is a heaven that is coming, that God really loves us, and that with joy we can come in with singing. And if you know the song again, you can sing it with me. And I'll sing it through once, and then we'll sing it together. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come with singing unto Zion. In everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away therefore the redeemed of the lord shall return and come with singing unto zion in everlasting joy shall be upon their heads it's very simple you can read it through the bible and sing it let's try it Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion in everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion in everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Let's sing the chorus again. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion in everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. The next song that we're going to sing is in Psalms 89.1. And some of the young people probably recognize some of these songs from camp a junior camp or camp meeting, but they're good ones even for our own personal worships. I find after singing and praising God in the morning, I can't go around during the day with a frown on my face. It's very hard to do that. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I'll sing it through once. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And with my mouth will I make known his faithfulness, his faithfulness. And with my mouth will I make known his faithfulness to all generations. And then you sing the chorus, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord again. Let's sing it together. 
I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. And with my mouth will I make known his faithfulness, his faithfulness, and with my mouth will I make known his faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Let's sing that once again. This time let's sing with lots of air. Let's sing with gusto. Let's sing praising God. I will sing. Ready? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. And with my mouth will I make known His faithfulness, His faithfulness. And with my mouth will I make known His faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. The last one that we're going to be singing this morning is found in 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. 1 John 3, 1. This talks a lot about God has given us lots of love and we need to share it with others. And when we share it, we need to share it with our families as well as our friends. And so in singing this song, we remember his love for us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God, that we should be called the sons of God. It's a little bit livelier. Behold what manner of love. Let's sing it together. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God, that we should be called the sons of God. Not this morning, but other songs that you can sing are in Psalms 19. The Psalms are filled with songs. Of course, that's what they mean. 19 uh, verses 10, and then I think it's 12 through 14. And also the first song, 23 verse 1, are also good ones. Another good one that I like to get up in the morning is called, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Another one is, Seek ye first. Another Christian song is, Open our eyes, Lord, and God is so good. I'd like to recommend this morning that you get some of these books. These you can find in your book and Bible house. This book here, this green book, is called Let There Be Praise. It's written, it's published by Review and Herald, and it contains scripture songs and hymns that are very good to sing. Another song book that you're very familiar with is the Adventist Hymnal, the Seventh day Adventist Hymnal that you use every week. What you might not be aware of is there's a companion to the SDA hymnal. And this companion tells the stories of the hymns and of the composers and of the people that wrote it. You might find it very interesting to find out where some of the hymns that you sing every Sabbath or during the week might come from. And this is a very good book. Another book that I'd like to recommend is for your children. Steve Green is a Christian singer and he has a series of 
scripture songs and hide them in hide them in your heart. These are all scripture songs that are really good for kids to sing. And there's also a, a book called Scripture and Song at the Book and Bible House that you can get as well. All of these remind us that God is loving and that God really cares for us. These are good to keep in our hearts. And with these songs of praise, we can lift up our voices to praise God each and every day and start the day off right with God. Shall we bow our heads for closing prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for giving your son to die for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you that we're able to share our faith and to share your word with our children, with our youth, and with each other. Help us to begin each day with singing praises to you, and help us to close each day with a thank you for a beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you for the Sabbath, and as we go throughout the week, help us to remember these songs and to sing them in our hearts and with our voices each and every day. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have a good Sabbath. Thank <laughs> you.